And uh, so we're just glad to see you all here today. Well, a few weeks ago, we started this series called The Power to Change. Now, we all like the idea of change. We like positive things in our life, but we don't like the effort that change requires most of the time. For example, let me just give you an example. How many of you, and don't raise your hand, okay, but how many of you, you would like the change of being healthy, being skinny, looking good? You'd like that change, but still like to eat however you wanted to eat. How many would like that? Don't raise your hand, okay? Don't raise your hand. <clears throat> we all like the idea of change. We just don't want to change anything about ourselves. We want our marriage to be stronger, but we don't want to change the selfish ways that we have. And so when we talk about the power to change, what do we mean by that? Well, the power of positive, permanent change can only come through an experience, an encounter with the Holy God, salvation, Jesus coming into your life, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Are there people that are Christians that have given their life to Jesus Christ that struggle with change? Of course there are, because they try to do it all on their own. They try to do it in their own strength. And the idea that we began to talk about was that the power of positive, permanent change can only come through the work of God in your life. It can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit. And once again, not on focusing on your own effort. Because for most of us, what we do is we do something that we shouldn't do. We feel guilty about it. And what do we do? We obsess over that behavior. We start thinking, well, I shouldn't do that again. If I was really a Christian, I wouldn't have done that or I wouldn't have thought that. And what we do is we kind of white knuckle it for a while. You know what I'm talking about, right? White knuckling, you, you grab a hold of something. You ever do that in church? I grew up in a church that had pews in it. And I can remember standing during the invitation when they would sing 400 verses of Just As I Am, right? And you'd put your hands on the back of the pew in front of you and you'd squeeze so tight. Why were you squeezing? Because you was afraid that somebody was going to point you out. You were afraid you are going to have to go down front, right? We've all been there. But the idea that you focus on that is always going to lead to failure, I believe. Because what happens is we become sin-focused rather than grace-focused. Now, does that mean that we should make excuses about our sin? No. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is the power for change can only come through the work of the Lord in your life. And it is only through getting to know Jesus that this power can become active in your life. Here's the point. Uh, if all you do is go to church to be moral, then you're missing the point. Jesus didn't come to make people moral. He came to bring dead things to life. He came to give new life to those that have spiritually been dead. And so what God wants for your life is not for you to obsess over the wrong things that you've done. But he wants you to get to know Jesus, to focus on him. And the more, here's what's amazing. The more I get to know Jesus, the more I focus on that, the greater the change in my life is. And the more powerful it is and the more permanent it is. Well, we began talking about that. And we've talked about several things. Today, I'm going to talk about how loving others leads to change. And we're going to talk about what does that mean to love others and how, as a believer, you need the church to help you love others. You say, well, I don't know that I need the church. I, I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard people say things like this. Well, I don't need to go to church to worship God, and that's absolutely true. You should be able to worship God in your car, in the woods. I started to say going shopping. I'm not sure you can shop, uh, worship God while you're shopping. Uh, I know some of you love to shop. I don't shop, okay? I buy. There's a difference. My wife likes to go look, and I'd rather have my foot run over by a tank than to go look, okay? Okay? But what I will do, if there's something I want, I go and I get it and I leave. I don't want to fill out any credit card applications. I don't want a 25% discount. 
They, they're like, would you like to get 25% off? No, I would like to pay and go on with the rest of my life while I'm still alive. That's what I'd like to do, all right? But um, the, the fact is, and I, haven't, I can't remember what I was talking about, what my point was. But uh, anyway, here's uh, what we want to talk about today. The power of what happens when you begin to love others and you need the church. I was talking about the church. That's what I was talking about. You don't have to be able to be in church to worship God. That's true. But you cannot go where God wants you to go, live how God wants you to live, change how God wants you to change, be encouraged the way God wants you to stay encouraged, apart from the community that comes in church. And I'm going to prove it to you from Scripture. And I know a lot of preachers will use that text that says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but uh, you, know, you gather together, you encourage one another, you prod each other to good works, even more so as you see the day of the Lord's return coming. Okay, Now, God only has to say it once for it to be true, but that is the very minor tip of what it means when the Bible talks about why you go to church. Why you go to church is so much more than that. And in fact, we're going to talk about it today. Uh, loving others, the really the only way you can love the family of God, the body of Christ, is by being together with them. Okay? There are 59 one another passages in the New Testament. It tells us what we should do with one another. In other words, the idea is togetherness. The idea is you gather. The idea is that you're part of a family. The idea is that you're part of a church. That's the point. And uh, whereas you can worship God anywhere, you can't do the one another commands in isolation. Because you can't love one another if you ain't ever around one another. All right? I know some of you think that. You, you like the phrase... Absence makes the heart grow fonder. And some of you are like, my wife left four years ago, and I'm so fond of her now, right? So, no, I, I'm saying that what Scripture teaches is that there is a way for us to love one another. I'm going to show it to you today, okay? Now, the most oft repeated of the one another passages is that we love one another. Now, we talk about loving each other a lot in the church, but let me ask you a question. What does that really mean? Does that mean that you have to like everybody that you see? Dear God, I hope not. All right? So, no, I'm serious. That's not... It doesn't mean that you have to like the same football team. It doesn't mean that you have to like the same things. It doesn't mean uniformity. There's a way to have unity without having uniformity. If you don't think that God likes diversity, just look around. If you don't think that God likes diverse things... Why then are there 300,000 species of beetles? Now think about that. If God is so interested in creativity and making things different, then why would he make 300,000 species of beetles? And the point is this. Um, you do something about the commands of Scripture when you begin to follow what God actually says. It's not that you have to like everybody the same way or everybody has to like the same movies, okay? Let me just say this. Uh, it's okay. I know some of you love uh, the, the series that, is, uh, that comes on, on television, uh, the one about uh, Jesus. What's the name of it? Um, the Chosen. I, I just drew a blank. I don't know why. Kim and I love that show. And uh, we've watched them. We haven't watched the latest season that's come up, but we plan to. Now, I have some friends, mostly pastor friends, that, uh, you know, are really hard to get along with. Um, they're like, well, you know, that's not completely accurate. It's a television show, all right? Uh, so what would you rather watch? The Chosen, which is about Jesus and inspires you, or about someone getting killed? Okay, so which, which one do you think is better? Well, you don't have to like The Chosen is my point. In order to love others. Now, aren't you glad for that? Because loving others doesn't mean you have to like everything exactly the same. So what does it mean 
that we are to love others. And I'm going to show you. Look at Proverbs 27, verse 5. And and even though this is not our text, it's something we're going to start from. It says, it is better to correct someone openly than to have love and not show it. Let me tell you this. I don't know many Christians that in their heart of hearts think, well, I hate Christians. Well, I hate other people that claim the name of Jesus. Most people would say that are Christians, no, I don't hate them, I love them. But the problem is not how we feel, it's what we do. That's the difference, okay? Because he said there in Proverbs, It's better to correct someone openly. Now, that's not always the best way to make friends, okay? That's not always the best way to show love, although sometimes you do have to correct people, okay? Sometimes to love your child best, what you got to do is correct that child, right? Okay? You don't truly love that child until you correct that child, right? Okay? You're with me on that? You can't go through life and ignore your child and never correct them and say that you love them, okay? But hopefully the correction is is a small part of that relationship. So he says it's better that you interact with someone, even if it's corrective in nature, uh, than to say that you love someone but never show it. And so the point is that if we're going to love one another, we got to put actions behind it. Now let me read to you. Our text for today, John 13, verses 34 and 35. These are the words of Jesus. Here's what he says. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That's that one another passage. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Now, let me pause before I read the rest of this. How did Jesus love us? It was self-sacrificing. It was putting others' needs first. That's a clue. You're going to love the body of Christ. You're going to love believers. And by the way, he's very specific about this, okay? Now, throughout Scripture, it shows us we're to love people that are not a part of the family of God. We're to love lost people. We're to help point them to Jesus Christ. Yes, that's important. We want to see people come to Christ. We want to see people join the church. We want to see people saved. But that's not specific to this command. This command, you know what he says? you got to love the people in the church. And then he goes on to say, by this will all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Man, there are a lot of churches that don't have this. I know of churches that there's just division. Uh, there are political uh, structures that... People argue and fight over. There's power struggles, okay? And and that's not, God doesn't say, listen, this is important. He didn't say that you'll be known as a believer by the stands you take against certain things. That's not what he said. Just because you may take a stand against a particular sin, okay, or you uh, boycott some company because they allow a thing that you think is a particular sin, that is not how you are known as a believer. That's not what identifies you to a lost world. Here's what he said. By this will all people know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Not just saying, boy, I just love, love, love. That's That's not what he's saying. This idea is not that you get very sappy and syrupy with one another. His idea is that you not get emotional. Nothing wrong with emotions. It's a part of what God created us to be. Good thing, emotions, as long as you're not ruled by them. But our primary way, according to Scripture, that a lost world, and that other people can know that we truly love God, that we truly have a love for Jesus, is that we love each other. That's what he says. Now, there are three ways that we can express this that I find in Scripture, and I'm sure there are others, but this is a sermon that we'll have to keep 
within the time limits, okay? So um, I want to show you three ways. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of categorize some of these one another statements that we find in Scripture so that we can learn from these one another statements how do we express Christian love and how does that lead to powerful and permanent change? Because when you begin to practice these things, here's the thing, it will change you. It'll change your church. It'll change your outlook. It'll change your attitude. It'll change your week. It'll change everything for the better. So how do you do it? Well, number one, you commit to Christ and to each other. You commit to Christ and each other. You say, what does that mean? Well, he's talking about togetherness. When he says you're to love one another, there's an obvious implied commitment to Jesus Christ. But there's also an obvious, and maybe it's not implied, uh, maybe it's a very direct command, you can't do the one another things if you're not around one another. Are you with me? You can't love one another if you don't ever see one another or ever talk to one another or ever hang out with one another. The one another things, it's very clear, it is implicit that we begin to understand that uh, it is necessary to have a commitment not only to Christ, but to the church. You say, well, you're preaching to the choir. I get it, okay? I realize that you're here today, and you probably would say amen, okay? But let, let me just kind of develop this a little bit. Uh, you cannot apart from community. By the way, the word church means gathering. That's what it means. And so you don't have a church without a gathering. A building doesn't make a church. A gathering makes a church. A body of believers makes a church. The, the Bible uses metaphors like a body, a family, uh, these are things that God wants us to see, that it's important that we're together. And the idea is you cannot do Christianity in isolation. It's not the way it works. We, now, does that mean you have to be at church 24-7? No. But what it does mean is that there needs to be a sense of togetherness and community because that's the only way to love one another. By the way, have you ever thought about this? that a lot of times it's hard to love others? It is, isn't it? Anybody ever just tick you off? Anybody ever just say something to you that offended you? Anybody ever say something to you that made you mad? Well, that happens to me all the time. And I have to work on... By the way, do you think Jesus wants you to give up? To throw in the towel? To say, I'm not going to hang around those people anymore. Well, aren't you glad that he doesn't choose to do that? And so you commit to Christ in the community. Let me give you a couple thoughts here. Romans 12, 10. Love each other like brothers and sisters. There's a, fam, a familial uh, relationship and connection. Uh, by the way, brothers and sisters don't always get along. Anybody have a brother or sister? Raise your hand. You got a, you got a sibling? Okay. I can remember when I was a kid, I was the oldest, and my sister... I would frustrate her to no end. One time, when she was little, um, I made a mud pie. You say, how do you make a mud pie? You take, mud, you take dirt and you put water in it, all right? And what I did was I put it in one of her little um, tea set dishes thing. It was a little pan, okay? And I told her I'd made her a chocolate cake, all right? And she was like, that's not chocolate cake. I said, yes, it is. You're going to eat it. She said, I'm not going to eat it. I said, you're going to eat it. And I made her eat it. And my, she went and told my mom. And then my mom made me eat the rest of it, okay? so <laughs> Now, sometimes brothers and sisters don't get along all the time, sometimes. But you know what? You love each other because you're family. And that's what God wants to see. Love each other like brothers and sisters. 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. Now, I, once again, I didn't say this. John wrote this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, if you say, I hate that person, you're a liar if you say you love God. He said, for if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? 
So it's important that we commit to Christ and to each other. Then Matthew 22, 37 to 39, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see how God ties together loving God with loving others? You say, well, I love God. This is the people that I'm kind of shaky about. I get that, okay? But you cannot say that you love God if you don't love others. And once again, love in the biblical context is not about emotions. Now, love involves emotions. Uh, Love can certainly grow and build emotions, okay? But biblical love, you know what it's about? It's about action first, then emotions that follow, okay? Now, in our culture, we have it the opposite. We say, she's my soulmate, he's my soulmate. I am not just, uh, you know, how do they say it? I love her, but I'm not in love with her. Well, you, you put that backwards. I am in love with her, right? Well, what we do is we put the emotions first, and our actions are dependent upon our emotions, So as long as I feel good toward you, I'm going to do the right thing. As long as I feel positive toward you, then I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to not be selfish. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to do whatever it is that those actions of love require. Well, it's very clear that in the Bible that our love is dependent upon actions no matter what the emotions are. And the emotions will always follow, I believe. They don't always follow immediately. When it comes to biblical love, that's the hard thing for us to get our head around sometimes because i got to be honest, I have done loving actions before to people that I didn't feel like doing it to. You know what I mean? I know some of y'all thought that I wake up every morning at 4 a.m. to the sounds of angels' wings flapping and that, you know, all throughout my head God plays worship music all day. That's not true. Okay, and, and just like you, sometimes I struggle with some of these commands that God gives us. And apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, I can't do it. And the way that you and I can fulfill what Jesus said to do is through obedience, number one, but the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's our actions that we focus on first rather than our emotions. Because sometimes our emotions will deceive us. Well, let me give you a second thought. Uh, not only do you commit to Christ and each other, in other words, love, Christian love is done in community. Uh, Number two, you commit to loving actions over emotions. Now, I've already talked about that a little bit, but I want to categorize some of, uh, for some of the, some of you, some of these uh, verses that we call the one another passages. There's 59 of them, and I'm going to give you all 59 But let me just kind of summarize a little bit, categorize them a little bit, and show you how that you can serve one another, love one another, uh, put the other's needs first through your actions, no matter what your emotions are, okay? Let me me just give them quickly. Number one, be honest. Colossians 3, 9 to 11, don't lie to each other. Don't lie to one another. Be honest. Honesty is important, okay? A lot of times we are two-faced. We lie. We're not truthful. We're not honest. You want to love others? Be honest. Be honest. Uh, then be humble. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. You know, a lot of our problems would go away if it wasn't for our pride. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, the fact is, I don't, I'm often too proud to admit that I'm wrong. I'm often too proud to admit that my way is not the right way. I'm often too proud to think that maybe your way might be the better way. Maybe I'm a control freak. Maybe I just want to be the one in charge. But he said, be humble with each other. And in humility, you begin to show love. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Then be united, Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. And I already referred to um, unity versus uniformity. 
And so living in harmony doesn't mean that everything is uniform. What it means is that you are, you've come together around a common cause. And when Jesus is that cause, the more I lift Jesus, the more I focus on him, the more I live that way, the greater the harmony will be in a church. Okay? You, you want to know how a church can get along the best? Look, I don't know if you know this. Some of you experienced this, but some of you haven't. Do you know that a lot of churches don't get along at all? There's political structures and power struggles, and uh, they throw rocks at each other, and you got people that sit on one side that won't speak to people on the other side. I mean, oh my goodness. That, unfortunately, is very common in, in many churches. But you know how to be united? You start focusing on pointing people to Jesus, winning people to Jesus Christ, and I've never seen it fail. It will unify a church. Be united. Be involved. Galatians 5.13. Serve one another. That's one way to express love is serving one another. I, I love how our church um, serves. We've got a lot of, we have a much higher percentage of people that are involved than most, than the average church. And I love that. But you want to express the love of Christ to others? Serve. Be involved. That's a way to express God's love. Be hospitable. 1 Peter 4, 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's the kicker, isn't it? I mean, sometimes we can be like just the wonderful host and the person that shows hospitality, but then as soon as they leave, we grumble about everything they did, right? Or even in church, you know, like we put on the, the Sunday face, we smile, and as soon as they turn their back, we're grumbling and complaining. Well, the Bible says do it without grumbling. And, and what does that mean? Well, if I'm doing something and I'm not grumbling about it, you know what it means is got my eyes on the right spot. That's what it means. Because if I got grumbling in my heart, you know what I've got? I've got my eyes on the wrong thing. I got my goal set in the wrong place because what that does is it makes it about me, makes it about my agenda, makes it about whether or not somebody appreciated me, makes it about whether someone recognized me or not. But when you do it without grumbling, it means you're doing it for the right reason. You're doing it for the Lord. Uh, be hospitable and then be forgiving. This is a very important one. Um, Ephesians 4, 32, forgiving one another. Now, let me say this. It's easy to forgive if the offense is little. If someone spilled their coffee right in front of you, well, you can forgive that. That's not a big deal. Okay, that doesn't take a lot of forgiveness to forgive. Let's go a little further. Let's say someone, you're used to sitting in a certain spot. Someone came and they sat in your spot and you're like, oh man, that's where I was planning to sit. I guess I'll forgive them and use one on the other side. That's not a big deal, okay? Because it doesn't really matter. As long as you're able to get a seat, it doesn't matter where you're sitting, okay? So that's not a big deal. But you know what's harder to do? When somebody has said something about you that cut you, that hurt you, that's not true about you, that might even, if the truth were known, hurt the church, and you can forgive that, well, you got something. It's easy to forgive little things. If your wife or your husband was a little grouchy before they had their first cup of coffee, not that big of a deal. But there are things in marriage that cut us and hurt us, and they get deep in us, and they're hard to release. How do you deal with that? He said, forgive one another. And then here's a big one. Honor one another. Be honoring. Romans 15, 7, welcome one another. Uh, Romans 12, 10, outdo one another in showing honor. You know, I believe we have a culture today that's not an honoring culture. 
Now, I'm not talking about comedy, and I'm not talking about even sarcasm, okay? Because I'm a fan of that, all right? But the truth of the matter is, um, we have a culture that doesn't honor. And I'm going to get, I, I, I don't get political, but I'm going to say something that you need to hear, okay? I'm going to say something you need to hear. It doesn't matter who you vote for. Listen closely. You need to honor those who the Bible says to honor. You say, well, I didn't vote for him. Doesn't matter. You might not agree with them. You don't have to vote for them. You don't have to agree with their policies. But you know what the Bible said to do? It says, honor the king. You say, we don't have a king, so I have to do that. Well, you know what the point is. It's talking about the political leaders. And by the way, do you know when that was written? The person they were referring to, you know who it was? It wasn't a Democrat or a Republican, okay? You know who it was? It was freaking Nero, the one that killed Christians, that burned them alive. And you know what Scripture tells us? Honor the king. We live in a culture that if someone disagrees with you, it's like they're your enemy. That's a weird thing, to be honest. You don't have to agree politically with everybody to honor them. You don't have to agree politically. You say, well, you know, I think they're evil. Well, I get that. And maybe they are. Maybe you're more evil than you think. Uh, but the fact is, God's word is clear that we need to outdo each other in honoring one another. Children, honor your parents. Um, people in church, honor one another. Live a life. Honor your boss. You say, well, my boss is a terrible person. I get it, okay? You may not like your boss at all, but the Bible says bring honor. Bring honor. And so um, we welcome one another. Romans 15, 7, welcome one another. Are you welcoming in your home? Are you welcoming in your life? We're to be supportive of one another. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. We're to support each other. Uh, we accept one another. Romans 15, 7, accept one another then for the glory of God as Christ has accepted you. Doesn't that always put a fine edge on it? He says, accept that person. You're like, well, I don't, I don't know about that. As Christ accepted you. Uh, okay. I mean, because if God will accept us the way we are, we should be accepting of others. Once again, by accepting it doesn't mean that you uh, say, oh, this person over here, they are living in this sin, and uh, I'm just not to say anything about it. That's not what it means, okay? But it means that you accept each other. I, I like to say it this way. Understand that the cross, at the foot of the cross, it's level. It's level. You might be Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, Okay? In, in that you've done a lot of good things all your life. But guess what? You need redemption and salvation just like the meanest person that's ever lived. Okay? And by the way, you might struggle with saying, you know what? Um, I just don't understand how they can say that this person was a serial killer and they murdered all these people and they got into jail, into prison, and when they got into prison, they got saved, they claimed, and, uh, you know, it's probably a jailhouse religion, but uh, they said they got saved, and then they put this person to death. I cannot believe for one second that that person is in heaven. You know what that is? That's a total misunderstanding of the grace and the power of God and the depth of your own sin. Because let me tell you something, you're just as guilty as a murderer. You say, oh, I'm not. Now, I'm not suggesting you killed somebody. And I'm not suggesting that telling a lie is bad as murdering somebody. I don't think the Bible shows that at all. But sin, all sin separates us from God. And until we acknowledge our own sin, then we can never truly receive salvation. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, if you think that that person that was a murderer and got saved 
doesn't deserve heaven, but you, maybe you grew up going to church, maybe you've been a moral person all your life, you do deserve heaven, you don't understand scripture at all, okay? Now you say, am I saying, am I suggesting that the Billy Grahams of the world are worse than, that are bad for, as bad for society as the Ted Bundys of the world? I'm not saying that at all. Nobody in the right mind is going to say that. But the idea that, well, that person, they were really, really bad, and therefore they can't go to heaven, but I've been really, really good, therefore I will go to heaven, is a complete miscarriage of what the Word of God teaches. And often the reason why that we're not supportive or accepting is because we have a misunderstanding of the gospel. Because according to the gospel, you remember the parable that Jesus told? And the guy owed, I don't know, some guy owed, uh, like, it was millions and millions of dollars. Uh, it was the equivalent of something like 100 or $200 million. Now, any working person wouldn't have that much money, Okay. And the king, he came to the king and begged uh, for patience. And you know what the king did? The king forgave him. $200 million of debt. He says it's wiped clean. Well, that same guy goes out. And there's a guy that owes him approximately $1,500. He'd just been forgiven $200 million. And some guy owes him $1,500. And you know what he did? He had that guy arrested because back in that day they had debtor's prison. And, uh, you know, you couldn't declare bankruptcy or just run up stuff on a credit card. Back in those days they had debtor's prison. If you couldn't pay your bills, you went to debtor's prison. He had this guy thrown into prison for approximately 1500 bucks after he had been forgiven $200 million of debt. A debt that he could never have paid no matter the point was that it was a debt that was impossible to pay. And then you know the story that his master found out, the king found out. He said, look, how wicked are you that you would throw your buddy that owed you 1500 bucks in debtor's prison when I just forgave you $200 million of debt? Do you know what Jesus' point was? We're that guy. We're the ones that owe the impossible debt, $200 million. You don't have $200 million? It doesn't matter what the debt is. If you don't have any money, if you don't have a way to pay it back, it doesn't, you can put $200 billion on it. It doesn't matter. The point is, it is impossible to pay the debt. And yet, we keep score for $1,500. Bucks. Now, I don't know about you, but $1,500 bucks is a lot of money to me, but it's not $200 million. And the point is that Jesus was making was this. You and I are like the guy that owes $200 million. And when God forgives us, it is our responsibility to forgive others. Why? Because of what Jesus has forgiven us. You can't even come close. Whatever someone has done to you, it's not close to what you and I have done to God. That's the point. And, and that was a long way to explain that. That we've got to accept one another. We've got to be patient. He said, put up with one another. We've got to be prayerful. Pray for one another. We've got to be transparent. Confess your faults to one another. And then here's the last thing, and I'm almost done. Speak encouraging words. We have loving actions. We need to speak encouraging words. We do it by committing to Christ and the church. We began to have loving actions that we prioritize in our life. And then we make it a habit of using loving words. Listen to what he said. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another. Are you an encourager or a discourager? Are you a person that every time you see something that you think is half bad, you just like run off. you got diarrhea of the mouth, all right? You just like run off and... You just keep on going and going and going and discouraging and discouraging everybody because you think that, you know, everything is so bad. Well, the Bible says to encourage one another. I've, I've heard well-meaning 
people, grandparents' age, um, and they see a young couple that has a baby. The ba- they're so excited they got a baby. And I've heard the grandparent age people say things like this. Well, I'm sure glad I ain't raising a kid in this culture today. And what I would like to do is just punch them right in the throat. Okay, that's what I'd like to do. But that would not be loving actions like I'm preaching about today. And that would make me a hypocrite. Okay, so, uh, but you know what I'm saying? Because they're just discouraging. And, And what I say to those people normally pretty loudly, the same God that was alive when that was written is the same God that's alive today. The same God that was alive when you were being raised is the same God that's alive today. So there's hope for this baby, this young couple, this young family. There's just as much hope for them in this bad culture as there was for you. Encourage one another. Use kind words. It says, be kind to one another. Ephesians 4. Be uplifting. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, build up one another. Do you build up or do you tear down? It's easy to tear down, isn't it? Man, it's easy. Speak friendly words. Greet one another. Now, some of you are friendlier than others, just simply by personality. I get that. Um, Some of you are like my wife. There's never been a room that you entered that you didn't enter mouth first, all right? And so you are loud. You love people. You meet people very easily. You can meet a person and be their friend and know everything about them within 10 minutes. I used to play in this basketball league that I played in for three years. Three years. I played three days a week for three years. And my wife asked me one day about the guys in the league. And I told her their first names. And she's like, what is their last name? And I said, I have no idea. She said, you've played with them for three years. You don't know their last name? I said, no. And she said, well, do they have family? I said, I have no idea. Are any of them married? I said, I don't know. She said, well, what do you know about them? I said, well, John has a good jump shot. All right, so... The point is that sometimes people get to know people easier than others, but God says we're to be friendly, we're to greet one another, and then we're to speak comforting words. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, anyway, that is what the Bible says we should do to show the love of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's easier to love than others. Sometimes it's hard to love. But God says we show it through our words, we show it through our actions, and we show it through our commitment to Jesus Christ and to each other. And if you'll do that, God says, you will see change in your life. You want to be changed? You want life to be better? You want your home to be better? You want your marriage to be better? You want your work environment to be better? Try what God says. It works.